from Lagos, the nation's commercial capital. This is the News at 10. Live from Channels Television. Reporting tonight, Ijoma Onyato. Hello and welcome. President Buhari holds virtual meeting with former Nigerian leaders to assess the fallout of the NSAS protest that rocked the country over two weeks ago. Governor Sanwo Lutro's scenes of destruction carried out by hoodlums during the NSAS protest in the state describes level of damage as mind-boggling. Some residents of Kwara, Oshun, Rivers and Okwaibom raid Kakovid warehouses, cut away large quantities of palliatives meant for cushioning the impact of COVID-19 pandemic. And U.S. President Donald Trump announces Sudan's readiness to normalize relations with Israel weeks after UAE and Bahrain's peace deal with the country. Plus we'll have business, sports and later on news from our studios in London. On business news tonight, Nigerian insurance firms brace for massive claims following vandalization and destruction of private businesses and public properties in two days of violent protest against police brutality across the country. And on sports news tonight, football personalities pay tribute to Brazilian football legend Pelé on his 80th birthday. It's a time for stock taking after the NSAS protests that rocked major cities across the country for over two weeks. And the president has met with former heads of state to find ways of resolving the issues surrounding the unrest. President Muhammad Buhari says 51 civilians have been killed in the unrest following days of protests over police abuses, and he blames hooliganism for the violence while asserting that security forces have used extreme restraint. President Buhari also says 11 policemen and seven soldiers have been killed by rioters as of Thursday, and the mayhem has not stopped. He says another 37 civilians were injured. He was speaking to a special meeting with former heads of state and other officials on the way forward after some of Nigeria's worst turmoil in years. The president convened a virtual meeting with the leaders, the vice president, Professor Yemio Shibajo, and some of his aides. Now, those who participated virtually from their homes include Generals Yakubu Gawan, Olusegun Obasanjo, Ibrahim Babangida, and Abdul Salami Abubakar, and others are Dr. Goodluck Jonathan and the Chief Ernest Shoneko. Your Excellencies, the mayhem has not stopped. Throughout the disturbances, security agencies observed extreme restraint. Yesterday, I chaired a meeting of the Security Council where the issues, the issue were thoroughly discussed. It is unfortunate that the initial genuine and well-intended protests of the youth in the parts of the country against us has been hijacked and misdirected. As Your Excellencies will acknowledge, government will not fold its arms and allow its grants and criminals to continue to perpetrate these acts of hooliganism. As I said in my speech to the nation yesterday, we will continue to improve good governance through our democratic process, including through sustained engagement. We shall also continue to ensure that liberty and freedom 
as well as the fundamental rights of all citizens are protected. Here, I want to also reaffirm our commitment to preserving the unity of this country. Let me assure your excellencies that the welfare and well-being of the citizens, in particular our youth, are a top priority of this administration. Once again, I thank you and look forward to your valuable advice. The Lagos State Governor Babajide Sonwolu says he's deeply pained by the level of damage to government and private infrastructure in the state. And he made the remarks after embarking on an extensive tour of the state to ascertain the level of destruction in the aftermath of the NSARS protests. We'll bring you more about that tour and just to show you exactly the places the governor visited in the course of this bulletin. Meanwhile, the governor also visited several hospitals to see the condition of patients that were brought in within this period. Amongst the hospitals visited were the Lekki Reddington Hospital and the Lagos Island General Hospital. The governor and his entourage were informed by the chief medical directors of the two hospitals that a lot of those that were brought in had been discharged. The governor thanked them for their service before leaving. Of course, the government hospitals we have indicated that government will be picking the medical bills of all wounded, injured patients for all of the things that have happened in the whole city. You know, if it had appeared at any of our general hospitals, nobody is meant to pay anything so that we can quickly push all of our consumables and rescue lives, you know, to the largest extent. We've decided that we're going to be easing the curfew from tomorrow morning. And so what that easing means is people will be allowed to go out from 8 a.m. in the morning to 6 p.m. in the evening. For emphasis, from 8 a.m. tomorrow morning, you will be allowed to go out, to go to wherever you wish, um, till 6 p.m. in the evening. We have also commenced the cleanup of the city because the city needs a whole lot of cleanup, a whole lot of roadblocks, tires burned on the road, and so Loma, like you've seen, are out already, and so they'll be working all throughout the night. But in the event that they do not finish, I want to admonish and appeal to motorists and our citizens to be careful on the road. Please, if you do not need to go out, uh, please stay at home. But if you must and you have to go out, please drive with a lot of caution because there's still a lot of barricades, there's still a lot of burnt tires that we have, broken bottles and broken things here and there so please be careful while you're on the road we will try and clean up the city overnight they are out already we've, we've pushed all of the men and women of loma they are out already doing the cleaning but in the event that they do not have um the capacity to clean it up fully um overnight i'm just you know advising all of us to just drive you know cautiously we will look at the curfew on saturday and sunday and we'll be come back to you um what will happen in the days, um, Monday, um, Mondays and, and Tuesdays and into the week. Well, days after the shooting of protesters at the Lekki Toll Plaza, and it appears calm has re been restored to that area. There was a presence of security operatives conducting stop and search operations of motorists and passers-by during the curfew imposed by the Lagos State Government. The curfew was imposed as a result of looting of shops and destruction of infrastructure which left waste and litter on many roads. Today, personnel of the Lagos State Waste Management Authority were deployed to the scene as they carried out a cleaning exercise on the Lekki Tollgate area. The plan of both the federal and state governments to investigate police brutality and prosecute erring police officers, create new state-based security and human rights committees, as well as providing compensation to victims of SARS, would be a game-changer in ensuring an end to impunity. And that's according to the Vice President, Professor Yemi Oshibajo, when he received an American government delegation led by the U.S. Assistant Secretary, Bureau for Democracy, Human Rights and Labor at the Presidential Villa in Abuja. 
The vice president explains that at least 13 states in the country, including Lagos, have since established judicial panels to seek justice and compensate those whose rights have been breached. He added that the decisions of the National Economic Council, which also agreed on the provision of monetary compensation to victims of police brutality, is getting the needed support of the president. The members of the United States delegation from Washington, D.C., therefore offered to collaborate with the federal government on the issues discussed. And more state governments have set up judicial panels of inquiry to investigate allegations of police brutality and other forms of rights abuses by security operatives. In River State, South South Nigeria, Governor Nyesom Wike charges members of the commission to be diligent in their work as the people are counting on them. Other states have inaugurated similar panels and they include Osho in the southwest and Adamawa State as well. This marks the inauguration of a nine-man panel that will investigate the alleged abuse of fundamental human rights and police brutality, especially by officers of the disbanded Special Anti-Robbery Squad, SARS, in River State, South South Nigeria. At the inauguration, Governor Yesom Wike charges members to be diligent in their assigned responsibility. The panel has 60 days to report its findings. I know that in just like this logistics have is always the problem. So I would believe that immediately you, you finish this integration, the chairman should be able to sit down with the attorney general secretary to government to write the, the, the identify where you will use for the where sitting. Let's have a seat. In the southwest of Shun State, Governor Guegao Yitola inaugurates a 12-man panel on police brutality, which is to begin sitting just as the state government suspends a 24-hour curfew across the state. Thank you very much. The panel of judiciary inquiry comprises of members from different sectors such as the academia, civil society organizations, youth organizations and more. Know that they are being called to this sacred duty at a time the status of the state as a peaceful one is being challenged, and at a time the recommendations and outcomes are needed to instill confidence in their rich youth and trust in the government. In Adama State and Northeast, an 11 member judicial panel has been set up to begin investigation into allegations of police brutality by the disbanded anti robbery squad. A Special Security and Human Rights Commission is also in the works with a mandate to supervise the newly formed Police Tactical Unit and other security agencies. To receive and investigate complaints on police brutality or related extrajudicial killings, to evaluate evidence presented and other surrounding circumstances, and draw conclusions as to the validity of the complaints. And in Taraba State, the governor, Darius Ishaku, set up an 11-man judicial panel of inquiry and restitution for victims of police brutality and other security agencies. The panel, according to the governor, will investigate rampant cases of police brutality and killings, ascertain the extent of judicial intervention in reducing the frequency of cases. To identify lapses in our legal system, if any, that aid police brutality and killings in Taraba State and recommend appropriate amendments. In Abia State, the governor, Dr. Okeze Ipgazu, has directed the setting up of a committee to ascertain the level of damage to private and public infrastructure as a result of the recent protests to enable governments begin immediate restoration. In part two, after the break, more on the fallout of the NSAS protests and the latest developments in Abuja and other states across the country. That's in a moment. Do join us again.
just joined us, you're watching the news at 10 on Channel's television, coming to you live from Lagos. A reminder of our top stories. President Buhari holds virtual meeting with former Nigerian leaders to assess the fallout of the NSAS protests that rocked the country for over two weeks. Governor Sonwolu tours scenes of destruction carried out by hoodlums during the NSAS protest in the state, describes level of damage as mind-boggling. Some residents of Kwara, Oshun, Cross River and Akwaibom raid Kakavid warehouses, cut away large quantities of palliatives meant for cushioning the impact of COVID-19 pandemic. And US President Donald Trump announces Sudan's readiness to normalize relations with Israel weeks after UAE and Bahrain's peace deal with the country. The palpable tension that gripped residents and traders of Gudu district in Abuja yesterday has fizzled out as normalcy returns to the area with armed policemen on ground to maintain security. Traders who locked up their shops and mounted barricades around the gates leading to the popular markets to forestall any attack by hoodlums are back to business. The chairman of Gudu Amalgamated Traders Association, Mr. Bond Namani, however, appealed to security agencies to remain on guard to prevent a return of the hoodlums. Everyone is now functioning well. So we are looking forward that both the media, the, 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 the arms, that is the police, the military, they are going to help because um, still, so but the basic issue is that, I always tell my people, you don't need to fight where you are earning your living. But if that fight comes, you don't need to run away. You must defend it. So basically, we are going to have meeting with those traders, both the house traders that are around us, to talk to them. Two days ago, we talked to them. We need peace within the environment. We don't need any problem. And once we are doing your business, we don't have any issue with you. Both the Okada people that are within these areas, we talk to them. So for sure, as far as we are concerned now, there's no problem. Now the Lagos State Government has been speaking on just the amount of damage to government and private infrastructure in the state. We reported earlier that he took a tour today. And let's just see where he visited and what he had to say. Ashes in the wake of the mob action that greeted Lagos from Wednesday, October the 21st, 2020. Burnt vehicles, buildings and other things. Over 100 BRT buses destroyed and a multi-million naira terminal amongst the infrastructure attacked by the mob. Vehicles and office complexes like that of the Federal Road Safety Corps in the Ojodubega area of Lagos. The seat of royalty in Lagos was not spared. The palace of the Oba of Lagos was visited with mayhem. The Oba's throne was even moved outside. Doors and windows broken, vehicles damaged, paper strewn all over. They say it's a desecration that has gone too far. I just not, cannot comprehend that something like this could happen in the most sacred part of Lagos. This is the home of our ancestors. They are all, all over the palace. And somebody can come in brazenly and desecrate the place and they think they can go scotch free. This is the beginning of the end for them. But this is also the beginning of the victory of Lagos. Also affected is the courthouse at Igbo Shere. This building is considered the oldest courthouse in Nigeria. Today, it stands a ghost of itself. The protests had ended and criminals took over and started vandalizing things. That's the correct situation of things. Not that this was part of the protest. This okay. wasn't damage in the course of the protest. This is just pure arson, pure crime. The evident carnage appears to pale as one moves from one location to the next. Shops and indeed the entire circle mall is a shadow of what it used to be. Broken windows, doors and burnt carcasses. 
Weighed by the sights seen already, Governor Song Wolu right. stops his store to answer a question about the cost of repairs and compensation. We need to think through ourselves, you know, um, we're just bleeding out of a budgetary, you know, um, plan. Um, Lagos had to reduce its budget this year, for example. Um, there are no indications of any great, I mean, um, um, IGL next year, you know, because of the pandemic. Businesses are just trying to come back, right? So where's the money going to come from? I, I don't have answers yet, right? So this is where, you know, the pain and, and, the, and, and, and the reconciliation has to be total. It has to be total forgiveness, you know, within all of us. The destruction is a result of a peaceful protest to end police brutality, which was apparently hijacked and snowballed into a mob action. Meanwhile, the panel of inquiry through. Meanwhile, the panel of inquiry set up by the Lagos State Government will begin sitting on Monday, October the 26, 2020. Nelta Ibe, Channel Television News. The governor of Cross River State, Ben Ayade, has joined other governors in imposing a 24-hour curfew on the state to check the escalating violence as a result of the NSARS protest. According to him, the curfew will take effect from Friday, October the 23rd, 2020. Residents of the state are therefore advised to observe the curfew as security agents have been mandated to arrest anybody who flouts the directive. Meanwhile, the Huara state government has described the attack by some hoodlums on the cargo terminal in the Ilori International Airport to prey on palliatives meant for the poor as condemnable. He also says that they do not reflect the good nature of the people of the state. The State Commissioner for Information, Harriet Afolabi Oshatimei, in a statement, says the actions of the hoodlums are condemnable and those who have already been arrested will be prosecuted. According to her, the state government would not tolerate anyone hiding under any guise to disrupt the peaceful atmosphere in the state. She commended the security agencies for acting with restraint in the face of provocation by the hoodlums. The River State Government has outlawed the indigenous people of Biafra, IPOB, following reports of violent activities in parts of the state, especially in Oibo, by suspected members of the federal government prescribed group. Governor Wike, who made the declaration during a statewide broadcast in Port Harcourt, says he'll sign an executive order to that effect and will meet with communities and stakeholders to ensure that it's effected in collaboration with security agencies. The state's chief security officer also declared one Mr. Stanley Umbere of LMA LGA wanted and placed a ransom of 50 million naira on him for any person who can provide credible information for his arrest and prosecution. The Liberal State government has severely pleaded, warned or even advised IPOP and its members to discontinue its institutional actions in River State to no avail. Instead, we are all witnesses to yet another orgy of violence and destruction inflicted by IPOP at Oyibo local government area and some parts of Paragon City local government area on Tuesday, 21st October 2020. This evil, wicked and audacious action resulted in the unnecessary loss of scores of lives, including soldiers and police officers, and the destruction of both public and private properties, including police stations, court buildings, and business premises. And from today, 23rd October 2020, the River State Government has, at Lord IPOP, from existing and operating in River State or any part thereof in line with the prescription order of the Federal Court and the Federal High Court and the Federal Government. No form of possession and agitation by IPOP or any of his affiliates is allowed to take place in River State or any part thereof, henceforth. Security agencies are hereby directed to stop any form of possession or agitation by IPOP in River State or any part thereof and arrest and prosecute any person or group that identifies with the membership activities of IPOP in the state. Government will issue an executive order to strengthen and ensure the effective enforcement of these measures. 
Following the positive response by fleeing inmates to the call for their return after jailbreaks at two federal correctional facilities in Benin City, the Edo State Government has extended the ultimatum issued to the prisoners by one week till Friday, October the 30th, 2020. The Special Advisor to the Governor on Media and Communications Strategy says this is the outcome of a security meeting held between Governor Godwin Obaseki and heads of security agencies in the state at the Government House in Bini City on Friday, October the 23rd. Now, he notes that the extension of the ultimatum is as a result of the positive response from the prisoners, as a good number of them have since returned to the two correctional facilities. He also explains that with the improving security situation in the state, the governor has reviewed the curfew to between 6 p.m. and 6 a.m. daily, starting from Saturday, October the 24th, 2020. As you can see, their hoodlums have broken into the warehouses in Osho and Kwara states where the COVID-19 items were stored. The youth forcefully entered the warehouses while the security manning the place watched helplessly as they carried different foodstuff meant for distribution to cushion the effect of COVID-19. A source says most of the foodstuff had been distributed by the government, but remains that of one local government which was being loaded when the hoodlums struck. And when the news at 10 returns, insurance firms brace for massive claims following destruction of private businesses and public property after protests against police brutality across Nigeria. Do join us again. Welcome back to the news at 10. Now, we told you earlier that the Lagos State Governor Babajide Sonwolu visited several hospitals to see the condition of patients. And let's take a look at how that visit went. You don't have any patient from the no. internet. You know, the, when I came that night, you had some patients with money. So have they been treated? They've been discharged? So the following day, um, we, got a, we got a number of ambulances in. Um, so that we could decongest the place okay. because there was a lot of collateral um, damage. damage. So the people who couldn't get home were assaulted, just random acts of okay. violence. And so they came in, many of those came in the following day. Okay. And as such, we had to have a system whereby we could create capacity. Okay. So wherever we, anyone we realized could be transferred out, um, we immediately did it just to free up the space. Okay. So, so the question is still is, you don't have any patient from the internet that you have not probably you. But we might have, I know we have two surgeries in Victoria Land, so I'll talk to um, um, talk to the brother and find out what I, I'm following up. Yes, but I will also still talk to them. You know, I want to thank you very, no, very, very much. I mean, I, I want to thank your entire team. You know, you've, you've actually been very gracious. You've been you've put up and been very A-class performance I mean, for all of us and negotiants. And Nigerians in general, I just want to thank you and thank you very, very much. Thank you, thank you very much. Right? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And Governor Bello Matawale of Zamfara State is asking for more security personnel to be deployed to his state immediately as they're experiencing an upsurge in crime since the recent scrapping of SARS across the country. Briefing State House correspondents after a meeting with President Muhammadu Buhari, the governor is also asking for a task force on illegal mining activities, stating that 20 people were recently killed at Talta Manfara 
while over 30 foreign illegal miners were repatriated recently. Governor Matawale states that the people in his state have not had the same bad experiences from SARS operatives as seen in other states and notes he's not calling for the reinstatement of the squad but simply asking for more security to be deployed to his state to solve the recent spike in crime. What we are saying is that like people that agitated for answers and SARS, we in Zambora State, we need all of the SARS in other states to bring back to Zambora State because we know how they are contributing to end this banditry and the other criminal aspect in the state. So because the SARS are doing a lot in the state, most of them that are, uh, you know, arresting these bandits, going bush, dead, in, day out, are SARS personnel. And since the disbandment of the SARS, we are now having a lot of pocket crisis in the president. So we are, in fact, I am to see Mr. President because the security situation in the president as at yesterday is very bad and uh, we hope government will do something so that to curtail this issue of insecurity in the president. Against Nigeria PLC, one of Nigeria's leading organizations, has held its 70th annual general meeting as the company recommits to delivering sustained value to its shareholders. The chairman of the company, Mr. Babatunde Savage, says that although the fallout of the COVID-19 pandemic affected operations, Necessary corrective steps have been taken to reposition Guinness Nigeria PLC in the competitive environment. Coming on the heels of its 70th anniversary, Guinness Nigeria PLC holds its 2020 annual general meeting but in strict adherence to the COVID-19 guidelines. Straight to the business of the day is the Independent Auditor's Report and the report of the Statutory Audit Committee. We are satisfactory. According to the company, the poor macroeconomic situation and the COVID-19 pandemic had a significant impact on the performance of the company in the year under review. The board and management have introduced innovative strategies to engender growth despite the challenging operating environment and put your company on a sound footing for the future. I am confident that the strategies being adopted by board and management we have the desired impact by improving shareholders' return in the years to come. The financial year end results indicate that from 131 billion naira generated in 2019, the revenue decreased by 21% to 104.37 billion naira. The company saw a loss after tax of 12.57 billion naira compared to a profit of 5.48 billion naira in 2019. Operating loss for the year came in at 12.83 billion naira when put side by side of operating profit of 8.96 billion naira in 2019. Earnings per share grew by 330% to 574 kobo in 2020. Although the company did not declare any dividend as a result of the business performance attributed to the COVID-19 pandemic, Guinness Nigeria PLC says it's committed to delivering sustained value to its shareholders. Our intention is that we go back to the tradition of regularly paying uh, stakeholders their dividends. And we do believe that uh, as soon as you know, performance begins coming back and the crisis goes away, we should be getting back to what we do normally, paying the dividends. Yeah. Most of the provisions are regulatory induced provision which means that with time, they, that those provisions can be written back to avoid the profit and loss account of the company to create for a bigger dividend for us. The year ended 2020 appeared to have been a challenging one for the company, but the board and management remain confident of the future. Let's take a look at some more business uses and Wilder. Thanks a lot, Ijoma. Hello and welcome to Business News. 
Insurance firms in Nigeria are expected to be inundated with huge claims following two days of massive looting and destruction of businesses, properties, vehicles and other assets by hoodlums across the country. The claims, estimated to run into several hundreds of billions of naira, come after violence erupted on Tuesday, October the 20th, after security operatives opened fire on unarmed protesters at the Lekito Plaza in Lagos. Most government offices, shopping malls, banks, media houses, police stations, government and private offices were all set ablaze by suspected hoodlums in Lagos, Abuja, Edo and some other parts of the country. Nigeria's insurance sector is currently grappling with the effect of the COVID-19 pandemic as it reported 29.53% contraction in the second quarter GDP report, which was released by the National Bureau of Statistics. Meanwhile, the International Monetary Fund has warned that the impact of the violent end SARS protest may negatively affect its overall growth projection for Nigeria's economy. And talking about the International Monetary Fund, it also says the recent NSAS protest is due to economic difficulties in the country. It also adds that living conditions in the country for the past four years have been very difficult in the wake of the decline in oil prices in 2016 and the COVID-19 pandemic. According to IMF's director, African Department, Abebe Selassie, social unrest is not uncommon, but the government needs to do more to raise the revenue to invest in key sectors that can create more job opportunities. Suffice it to say that, you know, uh, conditions, economic conditions in Nigeria, of course, for the last four years or so ha have been very difficult uh, in the wake of the decline in uh, oil prices in 2015-16. Uh, you know, uh, since then, the growth has been quite anemic. Uh, there's been a lot of pressure on uh, standards of living. So uh, there has been this dislocation. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, as always, when you have... Uh, uh, these kind of economic difficulties, uh, you know, social protests are, are not uncommon. I think this is exactly why we've been, you know, on the record in, in Nigeria about how really critical it is to, uh, to um, get uh, all of the policy-induced barriers out of the way to facilitate stronger economic growth, uh, for the government to do more to reven raise revenues to be, you know, from non-oil resources, to be able to invest in health, education, which would, uh, you know, allow people to uh, to uh, be more successful at getting jobs, but also improve uh, uh, the economy's potential. Um, so I think that development agenda that Nigeria has, I think, has to be tackled with gusto and and vigor, uh, so that you know the millions of jobs that the country needs can be created. Uh, and I think that agenda remains uh, very, uh, very, uh, very pressing. Turnover in the fixed income and currency markets for the month of September stands at 14.07 trillion naira, and that's according to the monthly report released by FMDQ Securities Exchange. However, the record turnover indicates a decrease of 1.33% month on month and 26.76% year on year while total forex market turnover for the period stands at $8.66 billion, and that's about 3.34 trillion naira. At the same time, the year-to-date turnover within the period under review was around 164.32 trillion naira, which represents a 7.69% decrease against the turnover of 178 trillion naira recorded as at September the 30th, 2019. OMO bills and foreign exchange transactions were the highest contributors to the FIC market in September this year, were jointly accounted for 54.48% of the total FIC market turnover for the year. Let's head to the Nigeria's equities market where it has extended the gains recorded on Thursday by an additional 70 billion naira. Investors are still latching on the low price of some fundamentally sound equities at the close of trading today. Let's hear more from Chimeze Obiwago. Thanks and welcome to the Stock Market Report. With relative calm gradually returning in the country after three days of violent protest, investors' focus has now completely shifted to the third quarter earnings, which are expected to be good. The earnings season has opened. 
Today, Seplet announced it will issue its third quarter financial results on Friday, October 30. Meanwhile, Airtel Africa posted an impressive half-year result. But aside from the anticipated good earnings, I explained yesterday that the unattractive yield in the fixed income market is also driving investors' interest towards the equities market. And so, the bull says, it's not going anywhere. The All Share Index remains up, this time by 0.47%. On the sectoral chart, it's all green, with banking top on the list, thanks to GT Bank and Zenit Bank. Industrial goods was led by Dangote Cement, while Nascom pushed the consumer goods up. The market recorded minimal deals today, but value was quite impressive. Investors' buy interests were more on the banking stocks, as we can see on the top trade chart, and I'm sure you know why, and its expectations. And so, now that things seem to be coming back gradually to normal, we expect to see more major corporate earnings releases next week, and hopefully the bull run will continue. And that was the stock market report. I'm Chimeze Obi Iwago. That's business news on the final trading day of the week. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Anne Mwawadu. The rest of the news at 10 continues now with Ijoma. Thanks a lot, Anne. U.S. President Donald Trump says Sudan has agreed to normalize relations with Israel weeks after similar moves by the United Arab Emirates and Bahrain. This comes a few days after Sudan was removed from the U.S. list of state sponsors of terrorism on blocking economic aid and investment. Announcing the deal, the president says at least five more Arab states want a peace deal with Israel. Here's Simon Pusey with more in Around the World in Five. Good evening and welcome to the Channel Studios here in London with your international news around the world in five. U.S. President Donald Trump and his Democratic rival Joe Biden have clashed over coronavirus, race and health care in their final live debate before the 3rd of November presidential election. 220,000 Americans dead. On the pandemic, Biden would not rule out more lockdowns, while Trump insisted it was time to reopen the U.S. economy. Trump cited unsubstantiated claims that Biden personally profited from his son's business dealings. Meanwhile, the Democrat brought up Mr. Trump's opaque taxes. Mr. Biden has a solid lead over President Trump in the polls, but winning the most votes does not always win the election, and the margin is narrower in a handful of swing states. Live with it. We have no choice. We can't lock ourselves up in a basement like Joe does. He has the, <laughs> he has the ability to lock himself up. I don't know. He's obviously made a lot of money someplace. Place, but he has this thing about living in a basement. People can't do that. He says that we're, uh, you know, we're learning to live with it. People are learning to die with it. You folks home will have an empty chair at the kitchen table this morning. That man or wife going to bed tonight and reaching over to try to touch their out of habit where their wife or husband was is gone. Learning to live with it. Come on. We're dying with it. Meanwhile, U.S. regulators have given full approval for the antiviral drug Remdesivir to treat COVID-19 patients in hospitals. The U.S. Food and Drug Administration says that Veclery, the drug's brand name, cuts the recovery time on average by five days during clinical trials. But the World Health Organization said last week that Remdesivir has little to no effect on patient survival. The drug was recently given to President Trump after he tested positive for COVID-19. He has since fully recovered. European states have tightened COVID-19 restrictions amid a rise in virus infections across the continent. La situation est grave. France will widen a coronavirus curfew from Friday to more than two-thirds of its population. That's according to an announcement by Prime Minister Jean Castex. The 9 p.m. to 6 a.m. curfew was imposed on Paris and eight other cities last week. It will now be extended to an additional 38 administrative departments for six weeks. Meanwhile, Greece has also declared a night curfew in its capital Athens and other areas. It will come into force from Saturday and will apply between half past midnight and five in the morning. Libya's warring factions have signed an agreement on a ceasefire after five days of talks in Geneva. The two Libyan delegations. The deal between military leaders from Libya's government and those from opposition forces led by General Khalifa Haftar was brokered by the United Nations. Its Libya envoy Stephanie Williams has called the agreement a crucial sign of hope for the Libyan people. Libya has seen almost constant violence since Colonel Muammar Gaddafi was deposed by NATO-backed forces in 2011. 
Preliminary results of Sunday's presidential election in Guinea indicate that President Alpha Conde appears set for a first round victory. The election commission has released fresh results which show the 82-year-old president to be the clear leader in the race, but the main opposition candidate, Celo Dalian Diallo, has complained of large-scale fraud and has declared himself the winner. There has been widespread violence in Guinea since the election and after President Conde's controversial decision earlier this year to seek a third term. North Korea has warned its citizens to stay indoors over fears that yellow dust which blows in from China could bring coronavirus with it. The streets of the capital Pyongyang were reported to be virtually empty after the warning. The secretive state claims to be coronavirus free but has been on high alert since January with strict border closures and restrictions on movement. There is no known link between the seasonal dust clouds and COVID-19. And finally, The Great Gatsby is back on stage in London, offering spectators an immersive and socially distanced experience. It's the first West End show to return with fee-paying audiences since the beginning of the pandemic. That's according to its producers. They hope to send a message of hope to struggling productions worldwide. Face coverings are compulsory and each audience member must remain socially distant. Temperatures are checked before entering the venue and hand sanitizer is provided throughout the show. And that's your international news around the world in five. Now back to the channel studios in Lagos. Into some sports now. Here's Ayotunde Tunde Balogo. Many thanks, Ijama. Well, the Ministry of Youth and Sports Development has denied that the National Sports Festival scheduled to hold in Benin has been postponed indefinitely. Now, the ministry says consultations with the Edo State Government or the Presidential Task Force on COVID-19 and the National Council on Sports are still ongoing to decide on a new date. Now, the ministry adds that it is considering a staggered festival spanning several weeks with no fans and strict adherence to the health and safety protocols. Well, as football legend Pelé celebrates his 80th birthday, Gary Lineker, Didier Drogba and Jurgen Klopp are just some of the football personalities paying tribute to the former Brazil striker who scored over a thousand career goals. Pelé is the only man to win the World Cup three times and is widely regarded as the greatest player of all time. Birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday, dear Pele. Happy birthday to you. Uh, one of the greatest players that's ever donned a pair of football boots. Uh, thank you for everything that you've done for us. Happy birthday, and I wish you many more. Happy birthday to His Majesty, His Highness, Le Roi, the King, Pele. Thank you very much. Leeds United have ended Aston Villa's 100% winning start to the Premier League season thanks to a brilliant 19-minute Patrick Bamford hat-trick. Villa came into the game having won their first four games for the first time since 1930-31 season, but three expert finishes from Bamford prevented the hosts, making it a club record five straight victories to open their season. The result sees Leeds move up to third in the table with their rivals still to play over the weekend, while Villa missed the chance to temporarily go top. A Real Madrid captain Sergio Ramos has recovered from injury and is now fit to play in the first El Clasico of the season against FC Barcelona this weekend. Ramos came off injured during Madrid's home defeat to Cadiz on Saturday and sat out the midweek loss to Shakhtar Donetsk in the UEFA Champions League. Despite welcoming back Ramos, Real will be without a number of first-team regulars for the trip to the Camp Nou, including Eden Hazard. Well, the second practice session for the Portuguese Grand Prix was literally lit up by Pierre Gasly's car catching fire. Now, the session was four to five minutes old when it was red flagged by Gasly's Alfa Torre bursting into flames, but then the Frenchman managed to escape unhurt. It resulted in a 16 minute delay, but just five minutes later, a second red flag was issued when Lance Stroll and Max Verstappen collided at turn one.
that's a wrap on Sports News. I'm Ayo Tunde Balogun. Back to you, Joma. Thanks a lot, Ayo Tunde. And the main news again. President Muhammadu Buhari today held a virtual meeting with former Nigerian leaders to assess the fallout of the NSAS protest that rocked the country for over two weeks. Also today, Governor Sonwolu toured the scenes of destruction carried out by hoodlums during the NSAS protest in Lagos State, describing the level of damage as mind-boggling. Some residents of Kwara, Oshun, and Cross River today raided Kakovid warehouses in the States and carted away large quantities of palliatives meant for cushioning the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. And the U.S. President Donald Trump today announced Sudan's readiness to normalize relations with Israel weeks after the UAE and Bahrain's peace deal with the country. That's the news at 10 tonight. Thanks for staying with us. I'm Ijoma Onyato. Do have a safe weekend and good night.